Today's class what? 13? Oh, we're getting close to the end, right? Let's see. Uh, all right, so this is lecture 13, and I want to talk to you a little bit today about separable spaces, okay? Uh, all right, let's start reviewing a little bit of what we saw in the last class. So last time, last lecture, we discussed about reflexive spaces, right? And the reflexive spaces, or the Banach spaces, E, such that this map J of E was equal to the E double stop. So E is essentially isometrically isomorphic to J of E. So it's, there is a, a copy that sits within the bidual and the, sp the space is said reflexive if this thing that sits inside is actually the whole thing. Okay. Uh, as we will see, examples, in the most important examples of reflexive spaces are going to be, say, Hilbert spaces, more general, say, LP spaces for 1 less than P less than infinity. We haven't proved this yet, but we will. But just so you have it in mind. And maybe if we have time, so these are, say, Sobolev spaces also for P between 1 and infinity. So I, you I, make Hilbert spaces in Well, I have to, to refrain a little bit of that, but uh, let's just say for the moment that all the Hilbert spaces that we are going to be dealing with are, are reflexive. Yes. Okay. But isn't, it, for example, L3 is not Hilbert space, the only one is L2? L3? Yes, I mean LB is only Hilbert if P equals 2. P equals 2, yes. Yes. For Hilbert space, you have to have the inner product, right? And the norm is the norm given by the inner product. And this will make the space uniformly convex. And this will be, yeah, reflexive. Uh, all right. Uh, and we have proved what? We have proved some, uh, some nice propositions. So what have we proved? We have proved, for example, one of the propositions that we proved was that if E is reflexive, if and only if, E star is reflexive. And we have seen this nice theorem of Takutani, which tells me that E is reflexive if and only if the unit ball Today, this theorem 
that says that uh, if my space E is reflexive, every bounded sequence admits a weakly convergence of series. So every bounded sequence admits a weakly convergent subsequence. And this is one of the results that I want you guys to take from this class. So at the end of the class, if I wanted you guys to list the 10 main theorems that you learned in this class, this would certainly have to be one of these results, okay? together with Habanak, together with the banach steinhaus together with the open mapping theorem, together with the banach alon group, perhaps this one, certainly this one is very useful for the applications. Good. Now, and there was a little bit of something standing in our way between concluding this from this. Well, the unit ball is compact in this weak topology, and I certainly uh, if I have a bounded sequence, it will be contained in a big ball, so I can assume without loss of generality that it's contained in the unit ball. So if I have a compact thing, can't I automatically draw a convergent subsequence just from the compactness thing? No, uh, it's isn't right. Exactly. So in this, generally, no, if you're just talking about a topological space, it's generally not the case. To be compact, it's not equivalent to be sequentially compact. This is true if you are working under the topology that is given by a certain metric. If you are in a metric space and you are working with a topology that is induced by this metric, then being compact is equivalent to being sequentially compact. Okay? But still, this result is true, and we are going to see how to prove it today, by showing that exactly in the unit ball, the weak topology is metrizable. Yeah, there is a metric that induces in the unit ball the same topology as the weak topology. This doesn't mean that the weak topology in the whole space is metrizable, and it will not be, but just in bounded sets you can construct a metric that induces the same topology. Therefore, this topology will be something that comes from a, uh, a metric setting, and then you can conclude We'll see how to conclude this thing. But for this, we'll have to talk about this particular topic. So this comes in the, as I told you, this chapter of Brazil's book is very rich, and it's we could spend the whole thing, the whole course, talking about it if we wanted to. As a matter of fact, this is the fifth class that we talk about this chapter. So I perhaps want to finish today and let the rest for you guys to take a look. Um, but having talked about reflexive spaces, today we talk about separable spaces and the notion of separability is intrinsically related to this notion of, of uh, metrizability of the weak topologies, as we will see. So the definition is very, very simple. So we say that a say metric space In particular, you could be working with a Banach space or a norm vector space, but just a metric space is separable. You'll just be working with the metric spaces here. If it admits a countable and dense subset. So space is set separable if it admits a countable and dense subset. I mean, you can find a, a, a countable subset that you get close, as close as you want to any other guy in the, in the set. Examples of this, as we will see, any sort of finite dimensional space, let's say Rd, okay, you can just uh, 
take, if you are working on RD, you would take the countable and then subset as just being QD, the sets of points with rational coordinates. You can get as close as you want for any vector in RD. Uh, LP, let's say LP of, of RD, uh, for one less than or equal than P less than infinity, this will be separable. Okay. You can start to think about what, how to construct a dense and, uh, and uh, countable and dense subsets here. But if you have, for example, the continuous functions on a, on a compact C of 0, 1, for example, this is also a separable thing. You have already seen how to construct a countable and dense subset of the continuous functions on 0, 1. How would you do that? By the stone vistras, you know polynomials are dense here, and within the class of polynomials, you could take just polynomials with rational coefficients. Yeah, so that's exactly how you prove that this is. Well, with a little bit of a refinement, you could certainly prove that a function with compact support in LP, a smooth function with compact support in LP, can be somehow approximated by, by continuous functions on this support. So, and this continuous function, so it's a matter of just Okay, you can approximate any function in LP by a continuous function with compact support. Any continuous functions in a compact support, let's say if you are in one dimension, could be approximated by a polynomial in that domain. Any polynomial could be approximated by a polynomial with rational coefficients in that domain. And then you make the domains like grow from ball of radius 1, ball of radius 2, and then you get an uncountable set of things that are here. Okay? Now you see immediately how this breaks to infinity because for infinity is not true that the function in L infinity can be approximated by a continuous function with compact support. This is just not true. Okay? Now you see, these are examples of separable spaces. In fact, L infinity is not separable, as we'll see. Uh, okay. So, first proposition of the day that I want to make is that if, let's say, if E star separable, then your E must be separable. Let me just see if this is the first one that I want to state. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Let's say, say, E bar X space. E of X space, so if E star is separable, then E itself is separable. We're going to start building up on this. Okay. How would we prove such a thing? Well, if E star is separable, let's just uh, try to follow the natural steps. So if E star is separable, so let Fn, my accountable family here in the star, be a Countable and dense fan set, subset. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so let's do this. Just take now. Okay, so this is obviously the first step. The second step now it doesn't seem too too obvious. So we have to start choosing what would be the countable and dense subset of E. Uh, like the, the 
J E, right? J of E. Yes. Yeah, yes. So what would you do with that? Uh, G of E and D polynomial. Yes. And G of E is a we did before we define G of E. What we know G of E is just a functional from E and yes. Corresponding to uh, G X is a uh, function to some point of F, uh, E. So we need to take uh, uh, such functions, countable functions, and uh, uh, we can take a uh, countable then substituting g of a. But if I apply the j here, yes, and then I'll go to e three stars. Is that what you're suggesting? Or no? Well, let's just see. S suppose if, if you were if you were on, on, a, on an RD setting. What are the functionals? The functionals are just given by the, the so-called dual basis, right? So there's the functional that takes e1 to 1, there's the function that takes e2 to 2, there's the function that takes the e3, sorry, e1 to 1, e2 to 1, e3 to 1. So there's, to, to a basis, there is the, the, the somehow the, the, each functional associated to a basis, right? And uh, this, this if, I want, if I had the functionals and I wanted to recover the basis, so I essentially want to find the, the, the guy in the space that somehow realizes the norm of the function. So if I have the function associated to the vector e1, when I apply it to e1, I get 1. If I apply it to all the other guys, I get 0. So somehow, uh, this is what I have to do. So, so if I'm giving you a bunch of functionals which are dense, so the idea is to choose xn so, so that xn realizes the norm of fn, so it's kind of in alignment with it. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you are in an infinite dimensional space, there may not be such an, such an xn that realizes the norm, right? Because remember that the, remember that the, the norm of fn is the soup of f of x, right? When x has, say, norm less than 1. So for now, let's just say, choose xn with, uh, let's say, xn being 1, such that f of xn, well, I cannot guarantee that it will be equal to the norm, but I can certainly guarantee that it will be bigger or equal than, say, uh, over 2 or over 3, some, some, some portion of the norm. Okay. So let's choose these xn's, and I claim to you that this will be somehow my basis. Okay? So now what we do is we divide in steps. Now we do the following. Uh, you consider the, the, the space generated, so xn is certainly a countable thing. So you consider the space, let's say, you consider the span of this xn the span over q, okay? This is this is the space of all linear, all finite linear combinations of x n with coefficients in q. Okay, so these are all finite linear combinations of x n with coefficients in q. This is still countable, right? This is still countable because this is what this is the union when k is bigger or equal than 1, of the span of, let's say, x1, x2, xk, span over q, and each of these is just q to the k. So it's a countable union of countable spaces, so this is a countable thing. Okay, so what matters is that this is a countable thing. Good? So let's call this guy uh, L. Okay. So I claim that, so the claim is that, the claim is that L is dense. And then you'd be done, right? You'd have a countable and dense thing. So in order that L to be dense, you have to consider that L sits inside, well, L is certain dense, L is dense in, let's say, 
let's say w, and w we will go to define as the span of r of this sequence, xn. So if I take the span over r and call this subspace w, I claim that L is dense in W. For every guy in W, there will be a finite combination of these guys with real coefficients. I can take the same guys, but just rational coefficients very close to the coefficients that I have. Since it's a finite number, I can get as close as I want because all the guys have norm 1. And you use just simple triangle inequalities to bound the norm of the difference. So L is certainly dense in the span of the real numbers. And uh, I claim that the, the, this subspace, actually W star, W, the closure, is actually equal to E. This would conclude the proof, right? So L is dense here, and W is dense in E, therefore L is dense in E. And to show this last fact, so to show this last fact, How do I show that a certain subspace is dense in E? Subspace is dense in E when I take all functionals on E, if I prove that it vanishes here, must be, zero. must be the zero functional, right? This is how I prove that a certain subspace is dense. So to show this fact, let us take, say, F belonging to E star, such that, Well, f vanishing in w means f vanishing in any of these xn's. Okay, if f vanishes in any of these xn for any n. We have to show that f is zero. We must show that f is zero. But how do we do this? Well, if f of xn is zero, the, 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 now let's see, now I'm going to use the fact that Fn is dense. So okay, so we must show, we must show that F is identically zero. Yes, but here's the normal, every Fn is zero, right? The Fn, let's see if I missed something here. Okay, so now, Let's say, given epsilon bigger than zero, we may choose a certain m, a certain fm, or fn if you want, such that uh, the norm of fn minus f is less than, say, epsilon. Right? Because fn is dense. Now what you do is, uh, you actually want somehow to evaluate this norm of f, so what do I want to do is, uh, to say that, the ba -ba -ba -ba, let's say f minus, Zero. No, wait. Oh, there's a type. Here. This, oh, a type. this is, should be Fn. Okay. Thank you. So, so we have that uh, also. Let's say from star. Let's bring this equation star. What we have is. Fn over 2, let me see if I find something useful here, less than or equal than Fn of x, and which is equal to the Fn minus F of xn, because F of xn is always 0. And this is less than or equal than the norm of Fn minus F. Did I do something like this? times the norm of xn, but the norm of xn is I set to be 1. So, uh, this is and 
this is less than epsilon. So therefore, the norm of f is less than or equal than the norm of f minus fn plus the norm of fn. The norm of f minus fn is less than epsilon. The norm of fn itself is less than 2 epsilon. So I guess if I get 3 epsilon, the norm is less than 3 epsilon for any epsilon bigger than 0. So this means that f should be this. Okay, and this is how we prove. Okay, okay, good. Now, the converse is not true. Remark. not true. Okay? We prove that if E star is separable, then E is separable. But the converse is not true. And the example, the counterexample would be E equals to L1. L1 is separable, but E star is L infinity. It's not separable. L1, if E is if L1, then E star would be L infinity. This is separable, this is not separable. And you say, well, Emmanuel, but I think I could do the exact same proof just changing the rows of x and f's. If I wanted to prove the, this result, I suppose that e is separable to prove that e star is separable. You would start, can I just change the rows of xn's and fn's in this proof? And why doesn't it work? Can, you, can anyone tell me where does this proof break if I just wanted to reverse the, whole, the, the, the roles of... Okay. Okay. We use this norm uh, if, uh, if uh, f is identical to zero. So in this case, uh, we use just difference in size. If identical to zero, so this is intense. If a point vanishes, every function, every function that vanishes on this point, this also means that it is must be the zero point. We just need this fact. If this fact holds, it should work. No, but this is not true. Because by Hambanach we, we know that there is a functional with whose value at this point is a, is, a, is a square of the norm of this point. So if this point is not zero, we will have a function which doesn't do this. Therefore, we will get that... Um, um, it's not exactly that, but you're going in the nice, in the good direction. You see, I could in principle try to reverse, change Every everything that you see here by xn is changed by fn and vice versa. The proof would not work. And the, the key point is actually right here in this line. How do we show that a certain subspace is dense? A certain subspace is dense when we can prove that for any functional that vanishes on that subspace, the functional must be zero. Yes, if it's reflexive, it's true. You got, you, you got the catch, right? Because here, if I were working to prove that E star is uh, separable, then I would have to get a function on in E double star that vanishes in this space, mm -hmm. that vanishes in the space of all the points. So that vanishes essentially in the image of e, the J of E. So you see, but if the J of E is not equal to the whole E double star, then I cannot reach the conclusion. Okay, so e, the, the fact that E double star may have more functionals. So you end up proving that every functional that is of the form J of E, if it vanishes in all the points, then it's going to be zero. But this is not true, They're not, not enough to conclude that the space is, is dense. But as he observed, the next proposition that we show is actually to try to correct this mistake. And it says that, well, now let's say if E is 
separable and dense and reflexive if and only if E star is separable and reflexive. to the proof because of this step here. Okay? Pay attention. Every time that you want to prove that a certain subspace is dense, the thing to do is to get a functional and that vanishes in that subspace and try to prove that the functional is zero. In this particular case, we get a function in E double star, but not necessarily E double star is just the J of E. So there are more you would be able to show that the thing that you wanted to show is zero if the functional were given by a j of, of x, but not for any functional eta. Good. But now, if we add a little bit more of structure, it's okay. So if I ask the space to be, if E is separable or reflexive, then E star is separable or reflexive, then this is true. And the proof, essentially, we already know how to do. So the way uh, back, it is OK with what we have already done, right? So we have already shown that E is reflexive if and only if E star is reflexive. So, so if I start here, E star reflexive means that E is reflexive. I already proved. And E star separable means E separable. This is the previous proposition. OK? OK. So this is from last class and last class plus proposition one. Uh, now let's go in this direction. Now assume E reflexive and separable. Assume that E is reflexive and separable. This means that J of E, just E double stars as a morphing to J of E, is also reflexive and separable. Do you guys agree? J of E is just an isometric isomorphism. So it takes whatever reflexive, reflexivity it's preserved by isometric isomorphism. And separability as well, because it keeps the metric, it's isometric. So whatever is a countable and dense set here is going to be a countable and dense set in J of E. So if E is reflexible and separable, then any, the J of E is always reflexive and separable. Now, but if E is reflexible, then J of E is isomorphic. It's essentially the whole E double star. So E double star is reflexive and separable, and then you use part one to come back. So from, from part part one, so you can come back to this step. So this is a pretty neat proof. Okay? state so we can discuss uh, the main theorem for today. It's the following. Oh. Here. Let's see. Uh, let E be a separable The ball of the 
do is matrix involving the weak star topology. The topology E star generated by the maps of E. Conversely, if So matrizable here, let me write down what, what I mean by this, means that there exists a metric that induces the same topology, okay? Use a metric that induces the same topology. This is what I mean by the topological space being metrizable. So in principle, there is no metric in there. You're talking about a certain set, a certain topology, but you may come up with a certain metric such that the topology induced by the metric coincides with the topology that you had before. results from topology, but if you tell me it's true, I believe you. <laughs> but help me prove it again. It was, I think, by embedding uh, if it's the R infinity or R omega and defining a norm with this R infinity or R, uh, sorry, yeah, might be the same. and then taking the subspace. So, the same so, so recall that the set is the set of Fs belonging to this star such that F yeah. is less than yeah. the one, right? This is the unit ball on the star. Yeah. This, is this is compact. Mm -hmm. This is compact in the weak star topology. Yes. Let's see. E is a separable Banach space. And what I want to do is, of course, so let me try to find the, to follow the steps here. So if E is a separable Banach space, we choose, we choose Xn. Countable and dense, dense subset of E. And uh, on and let us define I will define a second norm, which I'm going to call bracket F of a function, which will just be the sum of k1 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the k and then f of x k. So let's just put it like this. Okay. Uh, do I want it to be... I probably want all of x k in b in b e, right? Yes. So I want to show that the Yes, I wanted to show that. Okay, so blah, 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 blah. I want to show the separable space. 
this subset of, let me just choose a this subset of BE. Okay? So it's all the guys are inside the unit ball of E. Let us define this thing. Okay? Uh, okay, so I claim to you, let's see. This guy here, F, is a norm. Do you agree? Why do we know that there is a, a subset of B found up? I'm assuming that E is a separable ah, space. There is a dense subset of the whole thing. I'm just taking a dense subset of B E. Okay. okay? I want to show that this is B stars matrix. So I came that like well this 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 bracket that I'm defining here is a norm. Do you guys agree? So let's say if the function is if it, it's certainly uh, I can just multiply by a positive constant here in front, it will go out. I, there is the triangle inequality because the triangle inequality holds at each of these summons. And also if the if 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 the bracket of f is zero, this means that f of xk is zero for all k, which means that f is going to be zero. Uh, by the same trick that we did before. So if I have a dense subset of BE or the unit ball, I can just take the span over Q of these guys, which will be dense in the span over R of these guys, which will be dense in the whole space. So essentially the multiples of these guys are dense in the whole space. Okay? So, so this is a norm. This and this, uh, this third step to prove that the bracket of F is zero, then F will vanish in all of Xn. So F will vanish in the space generated of these Xn, which is the whole space, therefore f is zero. Okay, so this is a norm. Uh, and the claim, so this induces a metric, right? So this induces, so let's call, let's call d distance from f to g uh, by just uh, saying that this is equal to f minus g, right? Of course, here I have actually this bracket of f is less than or equal to the actual norm of f, okay? Because if each of these guys, since xk is in the unit ball, each of these guys is less than the norm of f, so I have 1 over 2 to the k, which adapts to 1. I'm going to define the metric with this bracket norm, so the distance of f, minus f to g is f minus g, and the claim is that, the claim is that this metric induces the same topology on the unit ball to do as the weak star topology. So what do I have to prove? Now I have two topologies in the unit ball of the dual, in this B E star. I have the weak star topology, and I have the topology generated by this metric. I want to prove that these two topologies are the same. So I have to prove that any open set of one contains an open set of the other one, and any open set of the first contains an open set of the second. Okay? So we do this in two steps. Let's do this. So step one, let's show that uh, let V be uh, an open set of this topology. Let V be an open set of this weak star topology. Okay? Let's show that there is a U, which is an open set in this other topology, that is contained in V. Okay. Uh, so, without loss of generality, without loss of generality, we may assume that this open set in the weak star topology has a certain basic form. It's one of the basic open sets. So, without loss of generality, we may assume that this V has the form, uh, let's say, F belonging to B, E, and just uh, uh, inside the unit ball, such that, say, let's say, 
f minus f0, comma xk is less than epsilon, epsilon value, for some x goes 1, 2, let's say xn's 1, 2, to some point. This is a basic neighborhood of this topology. For, for some points xn, and for a certain point F0, and a certain epsilon, okay? Uh, by dividing epsilon by a certain number, and each of these finite number of n's by the same number, I can assume also, assume also that each of these xn's has more or less than or equal to one. Okay? Because I could just take this neighborhood and Divide epsilon by 10 and divide each of the xn by 10 is the same neighborhood. So I can assume that each of these xn is, is in the unit ball. Good. Now what? Uh, okay, I'm making... Let me just change the notation here because I have used this notation before. So I'm calling xn the dense subset, right? So let me call these guys yn, okay? yn and yn. Let me call these guys yn. Sorry, why can't we choose them with uh, normalism? Well, the neighborhood is, is given by this. So let me call it instead of, yeah, okay. So uh, you, you, understand that the, you understand that the neighborhood is of this form. Yeah. For some point f0 and some points yn and some epsilon, mm -hmm. right? Suppose this guy, I mean, I can just divide by, say, instead of taking epsilon, take epsilon over 2 and take yn over 2. Mm -hmm. This is, gives the same topology, right? Because right. it's divided by 2 and 2 here. It's the same set of f's. Yes. So you just divide by the maximum of their norms and divide them both sides, and then all of them will have no rest of their equivalent. Okay, good. Uh, so, so I want to show that there is a neighborhood of this topology, U. Okay, so we want to show so that there exists a U open uh, with respect to the topology generated by this norm such that U is containing this field. Okay? Now what do I do, guys? So, so the first thing that I have to do is perhaps since these, so these YNs are fixed, it's just K of them, okay? So it's a finite number of points. These are not necessarily my xk's that I have, uh, which are here in the definition of this metric. So what I could probably do is just choose an xn which is very close to yn. Okay, so let's choose, let's first choose, first choose, uh, say xn minus yn. Well, here again, it's, it's not even, uh, because xn goes to 1 to infinity. So it's just here, let me just change the addition. So, so let, let me call this yk, and k from 1 to 2, blah, 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 to say big k. And let me choose xnk minus yk, such that this is less than or equal than, let's say, epsilon over something, okay? Uh, Let's say, but let's put epsilon here for now. Uh, for say k one two b k. Good. So for each of these guys, I chose one guy, which is so. So my guess is so our our guess would be to put to put the neighborhood U as being the set of. Uh, neighborhood U as being the set of, uh, how do I want to do this? 
So th this is somehow neighborhood centered, centered at F0, right? So I, my, my best guess is to put the neighborhood U, like seeing the, 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 the neighborhood such that the, the distance from F to F0 is less than a certain R. Okay? So this is a neighborhood uh, surrounded around F0. Okay? With this with R to be chosen. With R to be chosen, okay? Now, if I want to show that U lies inside V, so suppose so, if F belongs to U, then this implies that the sum, okay, 1 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the k f of xk has to be less than r. Right? Good. This implies in particular that each of these guys is less than r. So f of xk in modulus is less than 2 to the k r. Okay. Now, if I wanted to evaluate what this is, this implies that absolute value of f minus f0 acting on yk will be less than or equal than f minus f0. So I have to put the x and k into play, right? So this be like x and k. So let's just say yk minus x and k plus f minus f0 acting on x and k. So I, I didn't do much, I just added and subtract and k in the second entry. Okay? Now let's see. This first one is less than or equal than the norm of f minus f0. Okay. So perhaps I should assume that u is also a neighborhood, so this is f belonging to the unit ball. So it's a neighborhood in the unit ball. Uh, so the norm of f is at most 1, the norm of f0 is at most 1, so this norm is at most 2 times the distance from yk minus x and k. Plus, now, f minus f0 acting on x and k, this will be less than, uh, I'm sorry guys, so if f belongs to u, this means that the, the distance from f minus f0 is less than r, so here it should be, I'm sorry, it should be f minus f0, on this xk, this is less than r, so this means that f minus f0 in this xk is less than r, less than 2 to the k r. So this is less than 2 to the n k times r. Okay? So all that I have to do now, so if you started with epsilon here, if this is neighborhood such that f minus f0 against all of these yk's have to be less than epsilon. Perhaps you could choose here something epsilon over 4 here. So choose a, for each yk a finite number, 1 nk such that x nk minus yk is less than epsilon over 4. Then let's put our, let's define a neighborhood u in this other topology by putting the guys in the unit ball that, that such that the distance to f0 is less than r. And let's choose r such that each of these finite number of guys, so let's just put here nk, this is nk, so for each of these guys is less than 2 to the nk times r, and I want to choose this less than epsilon over 4, for little k, 1 to 2 to big k, this finite number, so I can certainly choose an r such that 2 to the nk times r is less than epsilon over 4, 
So therefore, when you put these things together, this will be less than what? Epsilon over 2, epsilon over 4 times 2, and 2 to the nk times r is always less than epsilon over 4, which is less than epsilon. So what you have proved is that for any guy in this neighborhood u, this thing here is less than epsilon, therefore this f belongs to v. Okay. So this implies that this neighborhood u is contained inside v. This implies, hence, u is contained. Now, conversely, let, let u be a neighborhood, let u be an open set in this topology. Okay? Let u be an open set with respect to the topology generated by this metric, which I call with the bracket. Again, without loss of generality, Without loss of generality, I may assume that uh, an open set in a topology generated by a metric is just a, a, a little ball around the point. So let me assume that U is just the set of guys in the unit ball such that the distance from F to certain F0 is less than R for some F0 and some R. We can even simplify by assuming that F0 is 0 because like, we have an algebraic structure and we can transmit the uh, well, be careful a little bit. I don't want to do that. Be a bit careful here because this this you know, for the proof, yes, you can do that. So you just have to find. Uh, so let's find V, an open set in the other topology that is inside here. Okay? So we want to find, we want to find, so now this F0 and this R are given, we want to find V, and this V is generally of the form what? F on the unit ball such that the norm of F minus F0 acting on some Y case was less than epsilon, right? For some case Y to BK. Now you have to choose this F0 tilde here and this this act this Y case for this neighborhood V. Well but in this case there is no better choice. I mean you can simply choose this F0 being the same center as here. And this y case being the same x case in your dense sequence that defines the norm. So let's just try to build a neighborhood of this form where we have to choose the big k and the epsilon to make it work. But which x case do we choose? Hmm? Arbitrary ones? Again, I'm giving you f0 and r, uh -huh. and I want you to choose epsilon and k of this form such that this neighborhood, such that this neighborhood V is contained in U. Okay. How would you do that? Well, then... Uh, just why is it possible that we choose the first K X X? Like, it could be the, the first, the tenth, the three thousand. Yes. So I think we need a sub, another subspace. X and K. I actually, you, you could do whatever you want. I'm going to choose the first, the, uh, the real first guys uh, of the sequence. But you could choose a subset if you prefer, but I'm going to choose the real first guys because then in this case, say, so in fact, let's say if, if 
f belongs to v, then I want to compute what is the distance f minus f0. This is just going to be the sum k from 1 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the k of, of f minus f0 acting on, on this sequence, xk. And this sum, I will split it into two parts. I will split it into the part when little k goes from 1 to big k, and the second part when little k goes from big k plus 1 to infinity. So the first big k guys and the remaining. Now, the first part of the sum, I will use the fact that f is in this neighborhood v. Uh, to say that this is less than epsilon, so this will be less than epsilon times the sum k from 1 to k of 1 to the k, 2 to the k, 1 to the k. And the second part will be just less than, what, this is less than 2. The norm of this is less than 2, and the norm of xk is 1, so it's going to be just 2 times the sum little k from big k plus 1 to infinity, and over 2 to the k. Now, of course, this is less than 1, so this first part is less than epsilon, and the second part, I can just choose my big k large enough, so this is less than, say, epsilon as well. This is less than 2 epsilon. Okay, uh, 4k large enough, so now let's just rephrase. So if I'm giving you f0 and r, and I want this at the end to be less than r, if I want to find r here, so what I want to put here is perhaps say r over 2 here for this first guy. So let's just put uh, r over 2. And the second one for k big enough will certainly be less than r over 2. So this will be less than r over 2 plus say r over 3 for k large. Okay? And of course this guy then will fall in this neighborhood u. And this is how you prove. Okay, so this ends the first part. So we actually proved that this this metric uh, induces the same topology in the unit ball. You will see in one of the exercises that this metric does not induce the same topology as the weak star topology in the whole space. I'm going to perhaps you can try this exercise. If not, I will put in the next homework. I think I already put in this homework, maybe, but if not, I'll put in the next one. Questions for this? This is uh, somehow integrate proof, but it's nice. But it's worth to take a look when you get at home. Let's see, let me, we're still missing one part, right? We're still missing the converse, which we might as well prove, uh, since, we are, since we are already here. So what was the other part? Suppose there is a metric to show that the space is separable. Now, so now, assume that There is a metric which I'm calling brackets that induces uh, the same topology as the unique star topology on the unit ball. Seen. So let's see, suppose 
There is a metric that induces the same topology. So what you can do is just consider this neighborhood, say, un, say, these are the f's in the unit ball, b star, such that this f to 0 is uh, less than 1 over n. So which of these are open neighborhoods in the topology generated by the norm? Therefore, they are open in the weak star topology too. So since the two topologies are the same, then there must be some Vn containing the Un, Vn of the form, say, f in the unit ball, such that f minus f0 uh, across uh, so some, some, some x less than epsilon um, for some finite x in this in a certain finite set which I call phi n, right? So this is this is a neighborhood of this sort. Uh, can I just say that f0 is zero? This is a neighborhood of zero, right? So okay, so let me say so zero belongs to this neighborhood. So, so I want a neighborhood that is inside this guy and contains the zero. So if the two topologies are the same, then, then zero belongs to this. This is this is open in the other topology. There is another topology here that contains the zero. So there must be a guy that is around zero. Okay, so I just guide it such that this holds. Uh, right. Again, since this is an open set in this topology and contains zero. This is an open set in the other topology that contains zero. So there must be one of the basic neighborhoods around zero in, inside the set. OK, so this is it. Uh, for a certain set of, uh, of x in a finite number. So the claim is, the claim is uh, this, uh, if you take the space generated by all of these x, you just call uh, phi to be the union of this finite sets phi n, then it's bigger than one, and then you take the span, so this is a countable collection, span of, over q over this set phi is contained in the span over r of this set phi, which is contained in E, and I claim to you that this guy is dense. This guy is dense in E. If it were not dense, then that would be there would be a function. If, if this guy is so, this is certainly dense here, and I want to show that the closure of this is e. Suppose it's not, then there would be a function on f, e star, such that f of this x would be zero for all x in this family phi. But this means that this f belongs to all these Vn's. We have to assume that f is also not zero. I want to show that f is zero, to show that this guy is dense. Ah, okay. Remember, this guy is countable. It's certainly dense here. Now I want to show that this guy is dense here. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I want to show that the closure is equal to this guy. So let's just take one guy on the dual that vanishes mm -hmm. in everybody here. In particular, that vanishes everybody here. In particular, that vanishes in all of these guys. Okay, so it vanishes in all of these guys. So if it vanishes in all of these guys, then this is obviously equal to zero, therefore less than epsilon, which is epsilon n if you want. Uh, then this f belongs to all of these neighborhoods v, which are sitting inside u. This means that f belongs to all of the neighborhoods u n. The distance from f to zero is less than one over n for all n's, therefore this f has to be zero. Then this guy is in fact tensing e. Okay? Okay. Again, I want to emphasize that this part here is the one that does not allow you to go to the dual statement directly. Okay, so we finished the proof of this result. Let me state what would be the dual result of this. The dual was. So the 
this is the next tier, tier which is just the dual of this one, dual of the previous. Okay. Let E be a Banach space with E star separable. in E star meets a weak star convergence of sequence. This is just 
Balak Awalu to say that this ball is compact, and the fact that it is separable that we prove now that the ball is also metrizable. So compact. The proof is just that this ball is compact by the Banach Alaulu plus metrizable by previous theory. Therefore, it's sequentially compact. This implies sequentially compact. Sequentially pre compact. <coughs> And uh, yeah, let me see if I have another one before I put the. Yeah. yeah, so finally, let me just prove the, the one that I started this class with. So, so here I wanted to prove that if, if E is reflexive. Any bounded sequence admits a a convergent subset. Okay. Let's prove this result. If E is reflexive, any bounded sequence admits a convergence of sequence. Okay. Now, I want to use this fact here. Somehow I want to use this fact. I want to go to a space where E star is separable to be able to use the, the unit ball in E is metrizable in the in the Weak topology. I already know that if, if my space is reflexive, this unit ball is compact in the weak topology, right? But I'm not saying anything about, well, how will I get that E star is separable somehow? I'm not saying anything about separability of E at this point. So if you had E separable as well, E reflexive and separable, then you could go to the previous result that we proved today that E star is also reflexive and separable, use this and conclude. Okay? But you don't even have to assume that E is separable in the hypothesis of this theorem because you are already working with the sequence. So for all purposes, you can just restrict yourself to the subspace generated by that sequence because obviously it will converge to something which is in that subspace. Okay? And if you take just the subspace generated by the sequence, you will get yourself a separable thing. So the proof of this goes as follows. And we conclude for today. So proof is that, okay, so let Xn be a bounded sequence. On it. Okay? So what you do is that we let uh, M be the span of this sequence Xn over R, and you get the closure. So I let M be this, this closed subspace. So this is contained in E, of course, and it's a closed subspace. It's just a subspace, the span of some, some guys, and you've got the closure. So it's a closed subspace of E. Okay. Being a closed subspace of a reflexive space, M is reflexive. We have seen this. And also this M is separable. It's separable because the span of this extent of a Q is a countable set which is dense here. Okay? So you have yourself, you 
pure reflexive and separable space. Therefore, M star is also reflexive and separable. This means that the unit ball of M by the previous result is, well, first, this is compact on this weak star topology of M. Sorry, the weak topology of M. This is Capitani's result. For this, we use that this is reflexive, that M is reflexive, and this is also metrizable. on the sweet story box. So this is the previous result. All right? Therefore, there exists a... So you have now a ball, or the unit ball, or any sort of bounded ball, of course, the result holds for any sort of bounded ball. Uh, any sort of, yeah, ball. Uh, but if you have a bounded sequence on a compact and metric space, then it's sequentially compact. There exists a subsequence X and K that converges weakly on, on N. Well, there's just a, 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 a subtlety here that we have seen before and we have dealt before that. Once I pass to work with the space M and try to forget about the, the space E that I had before, so this is just essentially M, but you may have your E here bigger, right? But this M is a closed subspace of E. I can talk to it as a bionic space. It's reflexive, inseparable, has its weak topology and everything. So what I find is that the unit ball, or oh, all my sequence points are here, so there's no reason that anything would converge to something outside of here, so all the action takes place here anyway. So the, the unit ball is compact and metrizable in the weak topology, so then there is a subsequence that converts weakly on M. So this means that well, we have seen many criteria for weak convergence, right? So, so this, 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 what I'm trying to say is that uh, this X and K converges also weakly on E. Because what it means to be converging weakly on E? Weakly on E, for example, it means that for all guys in the dual, f of xn, k will converge to f of x, right? So if f, x, n, k converges to x weakly. So this means that for all f in the dual, this has to converge pointwise to f of x. Why is this true? Because that f in the dual of E and f that acts in the whole E, in particular, acts on M. So every guy in the dual of E induces a guy in the dual of M. And of course, f of x and k converts to f of x because this converts weakly on M, as you know. Right? We have seen that the topology, the weak topology on M itself is the same as the weak topology of E induced to M, because any functional in M can be lifted to a functional in E. On Conversely, any functional in E induces a functional in M, so it's essentially the same thing. This is how we prove that this very last nice result that I wanted to keep of today. Let me highlight this. So, from now on, you are allowed to use this fact. You have seen, you have acquired the right to use and claim this fact for your life. Right? If E, if you are in a reflexive space, any bounded sequence has a conversion uh, weekly weakly convergent subsequence, or a convergent sequence in the weak topology. So every bounded sequence in a reflection space has a weakly convergent subsequence. Very nice. Go sleep and have good dream. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you guys next week. Oh, well, you see myself in the form of an exam. I will see you uh, 10 days from now. Have a good weekend, everyone.